Well, have you ever considered how much just practical influence you have in life? How much influence you have over other people or around other people? One of the most famous uh, American theologians is a man named Jonathan Edwards, and he is known for many things. He's known for the written works that he's done. He's known for being the president of Princeton University. He's known for being a prolific preacher. In fact, many of you have heard or at least heard in social studies in elementary school of his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And many of you might know him for how he would preach for two hours every Sunday morning and then come back at night so you have have nothing to complain about. But one of the most amazing things about Jonathan Edwards is the lineage that comes from him. There was a study of over 1,000 descendants that came from directly from Jonathan Edwards and his amazing wife, Sarah, where they themselves had 12 kids and 44 grandkids, but then seeing 1,000 descendants coming from them, there were known of three senators, three governors, three city mayors, three, 30 judges, 13 college presidents, 65 college professors, 100 lawyers, 60 physicians, 75 military officers, 100 preachers, 60 prominent authors, and over 80 other public officials. Just remarkable of the amount of influence that he would have, and and in some way, though not written in how we would normally speak of it, he would say that the most influential thing that he would do was go riding on a horse with his wife every night. The amount of influence of who people are as fathers to their children and husbands to their wives, we can see it generation after generation after generation. Or maybe you know of the woman named Amy Carmichael, who never married in her life. She was born into a rich agrarian Irish home, and when she, was, when she became converted at the age of 15, she always would go to her father's flour mill and would hand out gospel tracts until she was 18. And it was known that there were over 150 people who were led to the Lord by this sweet young girl who at the age of 15, 16, and 17, and 18 would just hand out gospel tracts and ask people if they believed in the gospel of Christ. When she was 18, she moved to England as she saw that that would be a place where she could be trained in order to be a missionary, but she didn't have great health, so it took a long time for her to actually get on to the mission field. She had to earn the requirements and the understanding of those who were over her that she could go to a foreign place and actually survive. Well, she later went to the country of India, and she was there for over 50 years without a vacation, without a furlough where she would set up and establish different orphanages. She would teach children and women in slums, and she would help women who were being sold off into prostitution of ways of escape out of certain villages. There she evangelized and helped people flee from the life that they had and into an understanding of the gospel. It was estimated that her total impact in the country of India reached more than a million people after just two generations of someone fleeing, getting married, having children, and their children in the same way. Influence is such a powerful thing. We just see in those two people, one a prominent professor and pastor and college president, another one just a a girl who went to India for the mission of Christ. Matthew chapter 5, in our case. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, actually speaks of the desired influence that Jesus aims for his followers and his disciples to have within the world. In his prayer, he says in other places, in John chapter 17, that I do not ask that you take my disciples out of the world, he's praying to the Father, but that you would keep them from the evil one. He wants his people to have influence, even if that means that they're staying inside the world. He says in verse 18 of chapter 17 of the book of John, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them or my disciples into the world. The outcome of our passage this morning in our hands is clear in following the previous verses that are before it. We are to be a certain way. We are to live a certain life of the Beatitudes. And knowing that some people will respond favorably to this, 
but also there will be others who will revile against Christ's followers. It's, it's just a known thing that in verses 11 and 12, you will be reviled. And in verse 10, for those of you who will be persecuted, Christ's announcement of his good news will cause people to come to him and also it will cause people to pick up stones and aim it for his head. And yet his followers are called by him to be like a sweet aroma in the world around them, to have such a personality about them that they are to influence positively the world around them. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 says that we are to be the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. The Beatitudes, as this text is a follow-up to that, are not just descriptors of the Christian heart to live in isolation not even in just a small group or in a church, but heart dispositions to be lived out everywhere you and I would go. So you ought to see your life not in this vocation or in this world or in this city, but rather you are to be on mission wherever God has you. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He gives a mandate for how Christians ought to live and operate in the world that he has placed them in. And today, certainly in our case, is a day. In this year is certainly a year where we, like many others, are led to look around and ask just simply, what in the world is going on? You know, every news update, you're like, I can't believe. Or you might just say, that's the most 2020 thing in the world. You know, the president of the United States contracting COVID, that seems like the most 2020 thing in the world to happen. And you might even lead to think of what in the world is happening with what we are seeing with racial tension or riots in the street or a lethal virus taking hundreds of thousands of people and on and on. And you ask the question, what will be the world's help? And you might even ask yourself the question, how can I help the world? And God actually tells you that through his word. Though Jesus was speaking before a great multitude of people who were on a hillside, he was, he was directly speaking to his disciples. The instructions that he's giving are for his disciples, but his concern is still for the world that was listening to what the disciples were hearing. He would then reach the world, not just by his disciples, but he would reach the world by his Spirit's work through the words and hearts of his disciples as they disciple other people who disciple other people. So here's the first question I want to ask you this morning, and not only do you know the amount or the kind of influence that you have with others around you, but I want to ask you a question, and I think it's baked into the tension of the text. Why does the world need the influence of Christians? I think about it. Why does the world need the influence of Christians? You might see that first on your outline where I am, that there is a certain inclination of the world around us that, that helps us understand why the world needs Christianity and the, why the world needs most directly Christ. Jesus is saying that the world needs salt and light because it's corrupt, and the world needs salt and light because the world is a dark place. I really like the summary statement of what G. Uh, Campbell Morgan says. He's a British pastor and teacher hundreds of years ago, he likened the tension of the text like this. So, so imagine him describing the text for you as a summary statement by saying Jesus was looking out over the multitudes of his day, and he, what he saw was the depravity of men's souls, the degeneration of life at every point. And because of his love of the multitudes, he knew the thing that they needed most was salt. He saw them wrapped in gloom, sitting in darkness, and he knew they needed light. If you were to look out on a horizon of people and were asked to describe what they might need, you might look at the physical things that they might need. You might look at the emotional things that they might need, but here Jesus is looking out over the horizon and seeing that they need salt and light. If you've got a Bible, I want you to turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. So if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, turn to the right several books over. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And I think this sets the, the parameters, if you will, on, on just the natural world's inclination. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 13. There towards the end of the chapter, it says, well, let me start in verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. 
kind of the same understanding of what we have with the Beatitudes. But in verse 13, while evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We have here the inclination of the world as evil that will only get more evil. The world will be worse and will get worse because there is no righteous foundation. Our era, just if you think of our society, we have seen incredible advances in science, in medicine, in agriculture, and even technology, but this has not changed a thing about the basic root and foundational nature of man and man's own society. If anything, we've only invented more ways. Think of it. We've only invented more ways to be unsatisfied with the world that we have. Like the most powerful thing in your life is in your pocket, and all it does is make you sad, right? Whether because that person is calling or not calling, or you see things and you compare, all we recognize is that the world is going from bad to worse. In comparison to the rap sheet that I read about Jonathan Edwards from the 1700s and the lineage that he had, there was actually a study done in the 1900s on comparing him and another person of similar nature. This person was named Max Jukes, who was born in 1720. And they, they should have had kind of the same background and the same understanding, even though their vocations were totally different. One was a frontiersman, but most notably an atheist and a very open atheist. In fact, he even said the only kind of woman that he would marry would be one who denies what I deny. He was accomplished in his own right, but his pursuit and influence was completely opposite of Jonathan Edwards. And in fact, what this study did is it studied a thousand descendants of Jonathan Edwards and then just 500 of Max Jukes. And what the findings were was that of 540 descendants, 310 died in abject poverty, 150 were felons, seven were murderers, 100 were incarcerated alcoholics, and 190 were female prostitutes. The influence that we have is incredibly powerful. And the aim of which we try to influence others and the fuel by which we do try to influence others can mean everything in our lives. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 7 says, The remembrance of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. If there's something very modern about how we can read this text, verses 13 through 16, it's with the understanding that all of mankind is infected with a deadly virus of sin. It's not something that we can run away with, but only something that we can diagnose. And we just say, that's just who we purely are. And there's no cure for this deadly virus apart from the grace of God. Turn over, if you've got a copy of the Bible, to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. So if you're unfamiliar, we started in Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, where it says, for every, or where it says and this is the judgment, the light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does this is true, comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. They love their own way and they hate God. That's the natural disposition of all of us in this room. But from that text, I want you to look just a couple of verses above it, starting in verse 16, where we have the remedy for this case of man's natural position. It says in verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So we see here that, that in this case, we see the inclination of the natural world, but, but rather the gospel is the good news that our holy God did not abandon his people due to their sin. The, the sweetness, think about that, that he saw us in our position of sin, yet he sought to save us. God rescued us for himself through the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, and life and death and resurrection of that son actually gives God's people new life. Though people are separated from God in our sin, 
The Holy Spirit awakens us to the reality and the position of our sin and causes us to turn and repent from their sin and our sin to the faith in Jesus Christ as our only hope and Savior. So as we look out around, what I, what I think Jesus is aiming to do in this text is to the undercurrent of reminding the people who would hear this of there to be salt and light into the world and be reminded that it was them who were far off, yet God in his love called them to himself. And they can have the permanent satisfaction knowing that when they place their trust in Jesus, when they believe in Jesus as the forgiver of their sins, that it was by his life that they have new life. It's by his death that their death won't be their last moment of awareness. That by his love they have been made new and by their confession they have been forgiven of their sins. So friends, I just want you to place yourself on that hillside uh, around Jesus, hearing what he was saying. Are you one of the ones who he was speaking to, meaning one of his disciples? Are you just one of the ones in the back who might be hearing this peculiar philosopher, teacher, rabbi saying these things? And recognize that that the gospel is for you to repent to. That Jesus is the one who you give yourself over to and deny your life by placing your faith in him. We see that the inclination of the earth is one that is hellbound without abandon. Yet it is because of the love of God that he brings people to himself. And then here in our text actually aims to send his people out to be salt and light. In the world, the tension within the text is the world is run amok. And Jesus has transferred the Father's beloved from darkness to light. And in obedience and in love for others, Christians are to be salt and light. I visited with a man at the hospital yesterday evening who is dying and probably has days to live. And one of the amazing and sweet things that the wife wanted to tell me about is how 28 years later, her prayers were finally answered. She said, no one ever nagged my husband like I nagged my husband to believe in the gospel, to go to church and sit with me, to read the Bible, to to pray with me. And it was only in a case when he had contracted cancer for the first time that on their way home from the hospital, he asked if they could pull over and go to a bookstore and buy a Bible. And he didn't like the Bible that he saw, so he bought three of them just in case one seemed better than the other or was a better translation. One was leather-bound, one was not leather-bound. And so he read those, and he kept reading them, and he kept highlighting them. And it was at that point when he saw who he was, when he recognized who Jesus is and what Jesus' call to him would be. I think Jesus is serious about the need of the world. You think about the seriousness of what that wife's role in her husband's life was for. You know, you get married and you think of a lot of things, but pretty soon she found out that that her role to be salt and light was with the person that she shared a household with, a life with, children with. And she was to be salt and light. And what a sweet reminder of the implications of Jesus' words in this text would be. I think Jesus is serious about the need of the world, salt and light, because of the inclination and the need of influence that the world has. So why does the world need Christian influence? Because of the world's sin. But now, secondly, why does the Lord's desire, or what does the Lord's desired influence look like? I think it's his own impression on the world. I want you to look at Matthew 5, verse 15 and 14, and look for some of the pronouns there. It sticks out. You there is emphatic, not just passive or anything else. Another way that it could be written would be, you only are the salt of the earth. You only are the light of the world. And with this, you see the calling orders from Jesus. Christians are to slow the decay of the world through the influence, and Christians are to be a light in darkness through their own influence. Man is created in the image of God. So God has impressed his image on us, and we are to impress his image on others. By grace, we have been made new. Our hearts have been regenerated. We have been converted, the scripture says, and through the Spirit's sanctifying work, we are made more and more and more and bit by bit into the likeness of his Son. And through that, people ought to recognize that something is different happening, that something different is happening in our own lives. And so as we are impressed upon, not just in nature, 
as the scriptures say, that only man and woman were made in the image of God, but rather now we are being impressed by the sanctifying work of God's righteousness in our lives. And so as a response to that, you all are to be that to the world. You only, the scripture says, are to be that to the world. But also the the yous in this text are not just emphatic, but they're also plural. Or maybe the best way that we could translate this would be y'all. All All right, so feel free to not cross that out, but maybe right to the side. Y'all are the salt of the earth. And the implication of that is for you to not think about your influence in isolation. What does one grain of salt do to a piece of steak? Well, if you have a good enough sized steak, nothing, right? What does one light bulb do in a city of Enid, 50,000 people? But what can our church do? How can our church influence by all of us coming together for the sake of the advancement of the gospel? You all are the light of the world, and you all only are the light of the world. One more word, the word are, tells us that we are to be Christians, not just act like Christians. The expression you might have heard in different ways, uh, uh, maybe in your own work or maybe in your own lifestyle, is the idea of being on. You know, you, you walk into a living room with three kids and it's time to turn it on. Or you might think of different jobs where you always have to be on. You're always on as a mom. You're always on as a boss. You're always on as a president of a company or a country. And that's totally different than maybe me walking into your living room and saying, okay, it's, it's time for me to play the fun uncle for 20 minutes. Because I can leave after 20 minutes, right? But the implication here is that we are to be Christians, which means we are to be salt and light, not take time on a Saturday morning and this is my time to be salt and light and then I can retreat and kind of do whatever I want. But if I go to that mission event, then I've done my duty for the year. The implication here is that Jesus sees the world going to hell in a handbasket and he's saying, y'all are the only hope for this world. Now, an application here is there is a retreating tendency or a tendency to retreat in the world today and in the church today that I think is just ungodly. It is often for us in fear or maybe just not wanting to deal with hard stuff in life to to just want to retreat in how we parent our kids or work within a job or maybe go off to college. Author and pastor Doug Wilson, I think, perfectly says that schooling your children is actually constantly preparing them for war because of what the rest of their life is going to throw at them. Professor and pastor David Prince calls singing in a church waging war against the devil. He calls signing up for something like VBS as standing on a holy hill and saying, not today, Satan. Or social critic and author Os Guinness says that going to work is like walking into an arena where the opportunity for God's glory is endless. So there is a tendency for Christians to want to retreat when we see the world around us as miserable. I don't want to go out in that. You know, if we see that something is going on, we just want to, you know, start the fire in our living room, put our hands in our ears and go, no, 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 no. But rather, Jesus is saying, you all are the only way that people will hear of me. Another application from this is I hope that it fuels your desire for godliness. I hope that seeing your role as being salt and light fuels your desire for godliness, that it fires up your desire for self-control, for, for steadfastness, for growing in Christ-likeness, that God uses people to influence the world who look nothing like the world. We cannot be liked if we are attracted to or appear as the darkness. We cannot be salt if we've lost our flavor, the text says. The, Lord answer, the Lord's answer to all of this is in himself. He has impressed himself on us in creation, but also by his spirit. And so these particular words, they portray what we're supposed to be. And so let me just encourage you, if you read this text and you just go, I'm not, I'm not like the salt, I'm not like the light. I'm not a horrible person, but no one would ever describe me in these ways. How do I do this? The the tendency for Christians and just for churches is to create like a 20-step program on how to be salt. 
And really, it's not that complicated. Worship the Lord with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. And that will look so bizarre to the world that they will see you as something different. How you carry yourself, how you are, because of who you worship, because of who you're being impressed by or impressed upon will change the way that you live your life to where others might recognize or they might hear you actually say why you're doing what you're doing. These words portray what we're supposed to be. Now let me describe to them uh, briefly to you as Christians of influence. The, the first, there, are, there are only two words, salt and light. So the Christian's influence is through salt and light, number three in your outline. Now I'm actually really bad on the grill, so I'm pretty familiar with salt. I'm pretty familiar of all the additives that you can put on a steak. I can actually buy like a really cheap steak and it tastes exactly like all of the spices that I put on it. It doesn't even taste like steak anymore. Now, it's valuable to me because of what it adds to whatever I'm doing. And that's what salt really is. It's valuable because of what it adds to the situation. And salt has historically been a valuable commodity. During the ancient Greek empire, it was so valued that it was called theon, which means divine. Salt was referred to as something divine. Or even in the Roman era, soldiers were paid in salt. So just to rip through a couple of ways that salt was used both positively and negatively, uh, salt was a mark of a friendship. Sharing salt with someone was a mark of a friendship, much like if I came over to your house and you offered me coffee and I say, yeah, but do you have any milk or creamer? You, whether you liked me or not, you would probably share something, right? Now, just to be clear, I would never ask for milk or creamer because I like coffee, but you can laugh. That means I like black coffee. So there was a mark of friendship where you would pass the salt to someone, even if they were a friend or an enemy, it was a a common grace that you would give. Salt creates also thirst, which is always the peculiar thing when you first hear about someone stranded on a raft in the ocean and they die of thirst. You know, whether you hear that as a young child or as an adult, you'd go, how can you die of starvation or how can you die of thirst on a raft in an ocean? Just drink some of the water but it causes more and more thirst to where it completely dehydrates you. Salt also stings when placed in a womb. Now, some people think that this may be the analogy that Jesus also has, that there's a positive and a negative here. And I don't think that's the case. I think what we see stinging people is actually the work of the word rather than the work of our influence. We're supposed to be salt and light, but also salt was used as a binding of a covenant. So imagine buying a house, signing the papers, and then going out to eat with your banker and eating salt. That's how they would sign covenants back in the day. Or you see this in 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5, where God made a covenant with David, and thereafter the sacrificial offerings in Israel were made out and carried out with salt as a part of that sacrifice. Or the phrase, the salt of the earth. It just means that you were valuable. You know, some kid might be described, oh, that, that, that kid's just the salt of the earth, or that person's just the salt of the earth. Everyone in Jesus' um, situation would understand that that would mean that someone is valuable. So salt is really valuable, and maybe that's your takeaway. Wow, Christians are incredibly valuable. We're so blessed. The world is so blessed to have us here. We're just a valuable people, like a bunch of gold bars walking down the street. Now, Jesus says they're valuable. Welcome to the world, or welcome world to us. But salt is known not by its value, I think, in this case, but by its additive power and its preservation ability. You've heard of the stories of ships crossing the oceans. Christopher Columbus, what was the most valuable thing that they had on the ship? Salt. Why? Because it would preserve their food. They needed salt to preserve their food and live out their life. So Christians are to be preservers of godliness and righteousness in a world that is bound for hell. A sweet aroma in the presence of darkness and hatred. The world is supposed to be tasteless without Christ's people. Hey, think of this. If our church was just amazingly swept away from Enid, we just closed our doors and said, we're all moving away, we would hope that a great loss of righteousness would occur in this area. Martin Lloyd-Jones comments about how the church saved many parts of England from ruin when he says that undoubtedly the church saved England from internal revolution and anarchy like that of France at the end of the 18th century. 
because there was no evangelical revival in France, but there was an evangelical revival in England. Now, this was not because of anything that was directly done by the church. There weren't specific orders of how we ought to live politically in a certain way from the church, but because masses of individuals had become Christians and were living this better, more peaceful, more meek, more righteous life. And they had heaven as their ambition, as God's children. And as the temples of the Holy Spirit walking around in our lives, Christians represent God's presence on earth. We are to be dams when the floodwaters rise or rescuers when people are falling to their graves. We are to be proclaimers to those who are marching to their damnation. And so with this, we ought to be really clear on what the gospel is. We ought to be really distinct on how we are different from the world and not be so concerned on being like the world so that the world will like us. This was such the damaging way of the seeker-sensitive movement in the 90s that if we can trick people into thinking we're cool, then they'll stay. What what happens if you've ever gone to like a party full of weird people? You walk in and then you go, "Mm, nope, I'm good. So we shouldn't be concerned with how the world ought to view us, but we should be very concerned with how we view the Lord. We should be very concerned and precise with what the gospel is. I want you to look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5. So that was Saul. I want to talk about Ephesians chapter 5. So turn over a couple of books to your right, maybe six or seven books to your right. Ephesians chapter 5. We have this great statement here about light. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. In the Lord. So walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Jesus is calling people who were in darkness and are now in light because of Christ, to be children of light or a light to the world. Light reveals what is wrong and false. That's what the clarity of the gospel does in relationship issues, with problems at home, with problems at the office, with problems in the field. What the light of the gospel does is reveal our fallenness and the Lord's grace. But it also helps to show what is righteous, pure, and true. Being a light means you are doing what Jesus did. He recorded in the book of Acts, or Luke recorded in the book of Acts by referring back to the book of, or the gospel of Luke, Luke, where he said, look who wrote Acts, look at who wrote Acts, and look at who wrote Luke, and discern what he was trying to do, where he said that all that Jesus began to do and teach was what I set out to describe in the book of Luke. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to live like Christ. We're called to disciple like Christ. We're called to do and to teach. But hear me, what we do is different than what Jesus did, even though we are to do the same thing that Jesus did, because our direction of what we are doing is actually opposite of what he was doing. Jesus walked and talked in order to call people to himself, and we are to walk and talk in order to call people not to ourselves, but to Christ. We see that the Bible often calls God, or God, the often, sorry, the Bible often refers to God as light. Turn over to the first book of John, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through verse 7, where it says, This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus, his son, who cleanses us from our sin. Now, light is not just given and received as a gift, but it actually changes who we are all together. This is why this is commanded for the church to be light as a whole. The church doesn't simply do salt and light things up once in a while, but the church is the salt and is the light of the king. 
John Calvin commented on Psalm chapter 2 in saying that Christ's universal kingship knows no limits and no boundaries. And this explains even why under persecution, Christians saved discarded infants, aimed to cure sick people, even buried discounted bodies that were left to rot and blessed rather than cursed their opponents. You think of the, the turmoil that God's people were doing this in, and it was under persecution. So you have the, the streamline here of the Beatitudes calling us to be a certain way, our heart's disposition to be something unique. And he said that at that point, persecution will come. And what do you do? Do you run and hide? Do you buy a better missile? No, you're salt and light. And so our text says we're to look like a city on a hill where we cannot be hidden. We're exposed for all to see. A a secret Christian is not a concept in Scripture. A hidden light helps no one along a path. Like the exceptional woman in Proverbs 31, verse 18, she doesn't let her lamp go out at night. Why? So that there's light available for anyone who needed to find the way around the home or light available for anyone who needed to find their way home. Now, last question, who cares? about being salt and light. Why should you care about being salt and light? Well, I think there's a glorifying importance of being salt and light. There's a direct connection between rampant societal lawlessness and ignorance of God and his character. Every sin that you and I commit is because we are not focusing on Christ or we don't understand him. Every societal problem in the world is because it is running away from the glory of God or the character of God. I think it's important for us to know that we can no longer assume in our county or in our country that people even understand the basic truths of the one true God. So the call for us is not to gripe from our couch or even hide in our houses, but to be salt and light. Why? In our text, it says, so that the glory of the Lord would be known. Look there in verse 16. And when, that's the wrong chapter. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The hope and outcome of people being within your light is to see your good works. The aim of the Christian is to be surrounded by others, not for popularity, but so that they can see the light of Christ. The point is, when others see us being a certain way, our hope and our prayer is that they see Christ in us. And the idea of letting your light shine, that's because there is a light in you the light of Christ. And our testimony says, don't hide it under a basket. The light that you're called to be isn't something that you're even made, that you even made or made up, but rather something that you are to be because you were changed. This was the task of Paul in Acts 17, where he went into a city and he just called out their ungodliness, where he says they don't even understand the character of God, and he there preached the gospel to them. And so I just want to lastly and briefly point out the chain here. There's, there's the chain of how things happen in our lives. We are to be people who are influencing other people because we have been so impacted or regenerated by the Spirit of God where the Son has impressed His nature on us and His righteousness on us because He did this for the glory of the Father so that the glory of the Father's name would be known beyond everyone. So we, may we be filled with the Spirit, so devoted to God that people's attention when working amongst us would be an attraction to God for His glory and His divine character. Now, there's an old photo. I don't know if any of you have ever participated in things like the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. There's an old photo in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes that is kind of their marquee of what they clearly aim to do. It always has a, field, or a goalpost, a bunch of people around a goalpost, and a kid with a Bible in his arm looking at that group of people. And at the top, it says influence. Now, in part, the photographer meant for that to happen in a different way. The photographer was at a camp on behalf of FCA, and he had a little kid with him with a Bible, and so he was aiming for that little kid to be watching kids play sports. With a Bible in his hand, you can see, a, oh man, cool Christians like watch sports, and we like, you know, we're linebackers, and we just punch the devil in the mouth and all that, right? So he's aiming for people to look, or he's aiming for this, to kid, this kid to look at athletes and for that to be the influence on that kid. And maybe, just hopefully, 
that kid will be an influence on those athletes. But there was something peculiar that kept happening. There was this shot and this shot and this shot. But in between all those shots when he was directing that kid, that kid kept looking at something else way off the field. On another field completely, under a goalpost, this kid, after he would do a photo shoot, kept looking at the other group of people. And there under the goalpost was a group of young boys where one was holding the Bible and teaching. And he said, why do you keep looking at those guys? And he says, because they're the only ones doing something different here. That's what we're called to be, salt and light into the world. The world will see us as completely different. That's not even the, the most different thing about us of what we preach, but who we truly worship. And so the reality is that we are called to be salt and light because Christ so loved us that he saved us. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for the influence that you have in our lives, and we pray that by your Spirit you would increase the knowledge that we have of you in such a way that we would work out our salvation in bringing great glory to you. O oh Lord, we pray that as we think about being salt and light, that we would be salt and light in all of our lives. 